Abba Kaba, Ni Hao Ma, and thanks for having me. My name is Mark, and I've been living out in Malaysia as a technology consultant for the past 19 years now. I actually wanted to come here originally to talk about just Bitcoin, which is a digital currency, a digital peer-to-peer -peer currency that allows people to make payments directly between each other without any central source or authority printing it. The problem is it's quite complicated. And as I was having my own adventures through the Bitcoin world, I bought my first Bitcoin five years ago, there's actually a lot I learned about the real world in the process. And it's that journey that I'd really like to share with you today. So I love my wife very much, but the one thing we always argue about is money. <laughs> Not just about how little we have or what we spend it on, but more importantly, where does the value come from? especially on the international markets. When you look at different currencies, there's always a misconception that the higher the, the value of the note, the more, more it must be worth. The problem is that's not always true. So what happened in Zimbabwe during their financial collapse was at the end of the day, it actually cost them $35 quadrillion in order to have the same value as one US dollar. And at that time during the collapse, a can of Coke was $40, 40 US dollars. So you can imagine these guys had to carry wheelbarrows filled with cash to go shopping. And it kind of didn't make sense. So Zimbabwe is not alone. Kenya also suffered from these same problems. In Kenya, you know, they were the, amongst the first to really understand how expensive it is to be poor. Not only do we spend about a trillion dollars globally printing and moving cash around, you know, all the way through to vans filled with cash and guys with guns protecting that. It's very expensive. And on average, we spend about 30 full days of our lives walking to ATM machines or waiting in lines at banks. And the problem is, this is even worse the poorer you are, especially if you don't have a bank account, you spend even more time at the bank waiting to cash those checks. In Kenya, the only thing that's really relevant is time, because time is constant. And it's really, the, this is the thing of software engineering rather than economics. In economics classes, they tend to teach you things that are really complicated to explain and even pronounce. Quantitative easing, for example, and inflation. What does it really mean? At the end of the day, it's just a central bank printing more money as required to kind of stimulate economic growth. It's all an experiment, really. Speaking of which, Japan, just last week, they suddenly decided that the experiment was over and that quantitative easing was a complete failure. It doesn't work. From an international perspective, quantitative easing makes it harder for us to go abroad because it makes our ringgit less effective. Domestically, it just means that we can't buy as much as we used to be able to. When I showed up in Malaysia 19 years ago, I was on the second note. And I was able to buy a full shopping cart full of things for 50 ringgit. Now, we can just buy oil. <laughs> so, going back to Kenya, what did they do? Software took over again, because in Kenya, Time is the only thing that's relevant. And over time, everything changes. M-Pesa was able to get 17 million subscribers on board within the first 12 months. And now, there's more people that use the bus to transfer money between each other than they do the banks. So where does this journey go to? We're here to talk about Bitcoin, right? I, I originally wanted to just talk about Bitcoin. And when I do, I always start here on the island of Yap, strangely enough. Because on the island of Yap, they had no natural resources of their own, nothing of precious. So they had to import these huge limestones, these rye stones. And rolling these stones down to the shop to buy some rhodi china, you can imagine it was a bit of a hassle. <laughs> so they actually came upon this really good invention. What they did was create the world's first public ledger. And that's what Bitcoin and the blockchains are, a public ledger. It was just a field. But they stuck all the stones in the field, and as a result, everybody in the community knew exactly what was in that monetary supply. You couldn't just print new stones to try to stimulate growth. You had to bring them in. 
Transferring money between individuals in this community was quite literally a song and a dance. But another thing that they innovated in was this concept of group consensus. And group consensus is used today throughout all technological solutions, especially those that are distributed. It required the, the majority of the village to all be there at the same time to sort of declare where the, these, these stones were being transferred to. But they never actually moved. They were always just in the square. In the end, the island of Yap, they had to switch to US dollars, as a lot of places do. And when people think of US dollars, or, or just money in general, there's often this thought that it's backed by something, that it's real. You know, and it did. It started off real. The first banks that opened in the world, how they worked was you used to give them your gold, and they would give you a piece of paper to say that you know, you, they would pay you back at one, one time. It's gold and other physical assets. Very few people actually understood that once you gave the bank your money, it was no longer your money. It's their money. You hope that they'll pay you back one day when you need it. And they usually do, but you can ask Greece how that worked out. <laughs> so, so who owns the world's money? It's really frightening. In 2014, Oxfam concluded that the 85 most richest people on the planet had more money than the poorest 3.5 billion people. That's a huge disparity. And that's only going to get worse over time. If you think of automation services, artificial intelligence, robotics, automatic manufacturing, only those that have money can afford to invest in those things, and they're going to become richer and richer. But what's even more interesting than who owns the world's money is where is that world's money? What's it made of? Again, a lot of people assume it's real. It's physical gold or something. It was in the old days. It's not anymore. There was, the stock markets were one of the first centralized digital assets to kind of exist that just invented money. $60 trillion worth of value there in the stock markets compared to $20 trillion worth of physical assets that we really have. But that was nothing compared to the derivatives market. I'm not sure if you've heard about the derivatives or not. If you've not, there's a really good movie you can watch. It's called The Big Short. It has Brad Pitt for the ladies out there, so no excuse not to learn. But the derivatives market is nearly $700 trillion of value. That, that's what props up our entire world at the moment, almost. And it's just regurgitated get, debt. It's, it's frightening. And of course, this all ended in tears in 2008, the financial bailout. More money was spent on, company, on, on bonuses, banking bonuses, than every single world war and space project combined. And it really upset a lot of people, including myself. I'm not even American, right? But it really got to me. And this is what started Bitcoin. It's what started the blockchains. Some people might have heard about Bitcoin. Some of you might have heard about blockchains. They're different things, but they're also connected. Let me explain. You could think of the blockchains as the underlying data storage. It's the ledger. Whereas Bitcoin is the first successful digital asset that's been traded on this ledger. It's been around for nine years now. No one actually knows who created it. It was invented by a pseudonymous person, a man, woman, entity maybe, we don't know, named, name of the name Satoshi Nakamoto. But in the white paper, they did cite that the financial bailout was the reason for this. What's most interesting, I'd say, is the technology behind it. And we all assume it's going to be something really revolutionary and breakthrough. But as a technologist, what was really comforting to find out is just how normal this thing is. It's created out of three sort of base technologies that have been around for a long time. Some of those were first theorized in the 1800s, um, some by the US Navy, some even by Napster. The most recent piece of the pie really is the Napster bit, the peer-to-peer -peer technology. But what you've got to remember is that if any of these security algorithms get broken, the entire world breaks, not just Bitcoin. The internet's running on elliptic curve cryptography. Every password we have in databases around the world is protected by a hash. So if those things get broken, we're in trouble. And so what was there before Bitcoin and blockchains and distributed networks? These are the known network topologies. So I mean, there's much more to Bitcoin than just the money side of things. For me, it's really about the data storage side. And I've been involved with databases now for about 15 years. 
In the old days, there was only centralized systems and centralized databases. The problem with that is when you take out that central controller or you change that central controller, everything else goes down or is affected as a result. So some bright sparks invented the cloud. The thing is, the cloud's not really new technology. For me, I, I've been playing around with the cloud 15, 20 years now. And it's only just become popular. Everyone's kind of heard about it, but no one really understands how it works. And it introduced new problems. If you intercept communication between sub subclusters, you take down those entire subclusters. And those are usually geographical in nature, which is why they invented distributed networks. Distributed networks are designed to fail. They're designed for nodes to come in and out of the network all day. So long as two nodes are still active, the entire network still functions. And that's all that Bitcoin and the blockchain technology is. It's just a collection of nodes. It's just a distributed network. In that network, everybody's equal. No one's in charge. Everybody has a copy of everything. And so long as the group consensus agrees, so long as 51% says that you have something, you do. On average, on any one time, there's about five to 10,000 active nodes mining in the network, protecting it, securing the transactions. This is just one of those 10,000 nodes. It's a liquid nitrogen mine in China. The blue is liquid nitrogen. Inside the liquid nitrogen are the computer chips, and the liquid nitrogen's bubbling because these computer chips are doing so much hashing power. Again, one of just 10,000 nodes out there. And all these nodes are doing one thing. They're protecting the network. So things have got really interesting this year. I mean, I've been playing around with Bitcoin for five years myself. It's been out for eight. But in two, this, this year alone, we've had over 100 banks internationally declare some kind of blockchain project. Over a billion dollars in funding has come into the ecosystem. And it's why we have people such as Bill Gates and Sir Richard Branson all claiming that this is the most important technology to arise since the internet. It's now being used for much more than money. People are protecting their art, protecting intellectual property. There's even some countries that are storing land registry on the blockchains. In fact, a little bit closer to home, just two days ago in Singapore, the Central Bank of Singapore declared their first blockchain project and are now working with six different banks to issue digital currencies. In Malaysia, we also have a few firsts. In KL, we have a Nasi Lamat place you can buy using Bitcoin. And in fact, we also have the world's first licensed equity crowdfunding platform in Malaysia. Malaysia was the first in Southeast Asia to regulate equity crowdfunding. And we have a company here that's accepting Bitcoin for investments called Ataplus. But why is everyone getting in a fuss? What's the big thing? Well, it's these four things. But for me, it's really that top one. It's for the first time, we have this immutable, tamper-proof audit trail. It can often get overlooked how in, in, important this is. So if you take a step back out of the blockchains again, and you look at the real world, databases, every single web application, desktop application, mobile, government agency, they're all powered by databases. And databases are really only as secure as the person that created them, the IT department in charge. It's very easy to accidentally delete a database with a few strokes. Or you sometimes hear about viruses affecting entire departments full of information. The big breakthrough with blockchain technology is that once you put information into a blockchain, it can never be removed, it can never be changed, and it can never be lost. This is massive. This is a really big thing. An open network without anyone can join and participate in. And it's probably why we have people such as PricewaterCoopers saying that although fintech's disrupting the banks, it's really blockchain that's disrupting fintech. So yes, I'm a bit of a Trekkie. And it's not just because of the clothes that they wear, but the thing I really like most about the Federation is that they don't have money. They abolished it a long time ago. In the Federation, your life is really dependent upon how much effort you put in. And that's, you know, we're all here for society. And although we've got a long way to go until we can reach this level of enlightenment, shared ledgers are a really important step in the right direction. Because shared public ledgers, they provide accountability. They provide regulation. They provide an inescapable audit trail. So again, this is an important step in the right direction towards that. Thank you for your time. And please do go out and Google more. <laughs>